inside of the door was covered in flies. We stepped back and looked at the rest of the house and the windows on either side, they were also covered, absolutely covered in flies. We went to the kitchen window and looked through that window to see if we could see anything. The floor, I, I'd never been in their house and I assumed it had black vinyl like until I noticed it was actually moving. The whole floor was literally covered in flies and blue bottles. And we noticed more flies on the other window and I said to my daughter, I said, well, we have to go back, we'll have to get in touch with the police, there's something wrong. So we phoned the police. Um, they came within about 20 minutes. They gained entry to the house, which looked like there had also may have been a burglary as well because of a broken glass round to the side of the of the house. The police gained entry and immediately realised that they were in a crime scene. Uh, they didn't advance very further because it was clear that, that the occupants of the house were dead. They, they were met with a very uh, disturbing scene. The, the bodies were left exactly where they'd uh, fallen some six, six weeks earlier. A murder hunt has been launched on Merseyside after an elderly couple were found dead at their home. They were found in Melling. Police say their bodies were heavily decomposed. What they found was um, they, two bodies that they thought at first had been shot. And certainly that's the information that I was given, that there appeared to be signs of a burglary and the, the occupants had been shot, which of course um, gives a whole different impression about um, what, what actually has taken place. Um, but the state, the, 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 the state of the, the bodies was such that it was, they were unable, uh, just on a visual check, to establish what the cause of death was. And we'd have to wait um, a couple of days later for the post-mortem findings of that. The police were keen to find Brian Blackwell to tell him of his parents' deaths. They tracked him down to his girlfriend Amal Saba's house, where he'd been staying since they returned from America more than three weeks before. I sent two officers out to that address, and uh, shortly afterwards, um, Brian arrived in the um, in the car that we'd been looking for. Um, they went into the house, which is Amal's home, uh, where um, Amal and her mother were, and they broke the news to Brian that um, his parents uh, had been found in the house and were both dead. Um, he reacted like you would expect from somebody who'd been given such awful news. He was uh, stunned uh, and then became very upset. Um, about what had taken place, but then felt that it couldn't be them because they were in Spain. The police wanted to speak to Brian because they knew from inquiries that uh, he was likely to have been the last person to have seen his parents. Um, uh, to that extent, he wasn't a suspect initially, but uh, as soon as the, uh, the police arrived uh, at Amal's house and spoke to him, uh, they, uh, they obviously suspected that he knew a lot more uh, than, uh, uh, than he was initially telling them. My suspicions had fallen on Brian quite early on, but it was something he said that really confirmed those suspicions when he spoke to one of the officers and, and quite out of context asked him if prison was cold. At that point, I decided that Brian was to be arrested for the murder of his parents. As time was going on with the interviews, um, that Brian was gaining in confidence uh, and becoming more sure of himself. Um, it was a tactic of ours that... Um, in the initial parts of the interview, we would simply ask Brian. Brian would simply be asked for his explanation, his whereabouts, um, and his account of what had gone on over the weeks, and that little, or if any, challenge was going to be made to anything that he, he said. It was very curious. He, um, he didn't necessarily exhibit the signs that one might expect uh, of a young man whose parents had been uh, so brutally slain in their own home. One gets the impression that uh, he felt he could almost lie his way out of trouble even at that stage, even in the police station. And there's a suggestion that uh, he probably felt that he was cleverer uh, in some way uh, than those interviewing him. I'm here, obviously because the police suspect me for doing this. I've been asked a number of what I consider to be slightly relevant questions. I believe that should be done more as a witness rather than a suspect. The reason I was arrested was because I, I admitted to going to the house. There's other people who have been of the house, so obviously in my mind I'm wondering why they haven't been arrested. But in, I, I think I've proven I've not been here when it's happened. And obviously, if I wasn't here to do it, then I shouldn't be held. While Brian Blackwell was being interviewed, 
police were carrying out round-the-clock searches of the Blackwells and Amal's house for evidence which would lead them to the killer. It was during the course of one of those evenings that a bag was found um, which belonged to Brian that had actually been asked, they'd asked him to put into the garage because it somewhat smelt. They opened the bag and in it was found a hammer, but more importantly a set of keys to the house. Now, Brian had always maintained throughout that he couldn't have gained access to the house because he didn't have keys for it uh, and that he'd been locked out of the house and therefore couldn't go in. The finding of the keys or, or putting of this information to Brian was a significant point in the interview because the police were able to demonstrate to Brian that the account that he'd given to them simply wasn't true up until this point. Now is the time also um, to change our interview tactics and, more importantly, our interview team because I wanted Brian to consider this uh, important piece of evidence, being unfamiliar with the people who were talking to him. He was then interviewed by two different people, and during the course of that, Brian then confessed. I had, during the day, been putting up um, pictures on my wall. I'd just come in for lunch, lunch and started having a discussion. It got to a violent stage in the arguments with my dad, where I obviously felt under pressure enough to push back and I struck him with the soft side of the hammer. Yeah, that the party hammer nailed him with. It knocked him back slightly. It was a split reaction. My mum was in the kitchen. I obviously heard the commotion and everything. She came in with a carving knife up in a stabby motion. Obviously for self-defense, I swung more than anything, swung the hammer just to get myself free. I'm not sure who exactly I've struck, where, how many times or anything. And I remember I did take the knife. I just should have my dad lying in the seat. And and there was some blood coming up. My mum said, what did you do, boo? Brian Blackwell Sr. and his wife Jacqueline have been stabbed and bludgeoned to death by their teenage son, Brian. After confessing to the horrific crime, Brian claims he killed his doting parents during a violent row. But police forensics give a very different picture of what happened on that fateful day. Brian Blackwell Sr. had sustained massive head injuries consistent with being struck repeatedly with, uh, with a hammer or other similar object. He had um, several stab wounds to the left side of his face. He'd suffered stab wounds to, to the upper chest and significantly uh, he'd suffered uh, stab wounds, slash wounds to his arms uh, and hands. And the uh, forensic science opinion was that, and indeed a pathologist's opinion, was that those marks on Brian Blackwell Sr.'s hands and arms were entirely consistent with defensive injuries. So it's apparent that uh, he was a subject of a, of a savage and violent attack whilst he was sat in the chair. There is no evidence whatsoever of any other struggle taking place uh, in that room. There was no upturned furniture, there was nothing broken. There was no evidence at all of, uh, of any kind of fight or other uh, physical altercation that was um, in any way consistent with what Brian had alleged. I spoke to him for a bit and told him I still loved him. <laughs> I probably believed, believed what I'd done. I saw my mum and she seemed alive. <laughs> when you say she seemed She did look cold, I was like a dead person. <laughs> I thought she may still be alive. Alive. <laughs> For some reason, I can't honestly explain. I pulled this bathroom. I think I splashed some water on it. I asked him to come back. <laughs> it's very difficult to say what what sort of remorse he 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 actually demonstrated because certainly they found that he was. Um, a fairly manipulative uh, sort of young man who was able to put on um, whatever face seemed to be acceptable uh, to the events. Yes, he became upset, um, but whether that was true remorse, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure it was. The thing was, so I didn't think that the blade from 
I didn't think the blades had particularly gone in deep because I don't know how easy a blade goes into somebody, but it was just a shot. <laughs> Just short jabs, it's probably the blade is like an inch away from him each time. And with my mom. And I couldn't see it because he was very close. I thought it was barely. But I can't believe though that someone would die so easily. It seems like just a bit of commotion. I couldn't believe that someone would have died so easily from that. Two days after his arrest. Brian Blackwell was charged with the murder of his parents. The people closest to Brian couldn't believe this intelligent, quiet and polite young man could be responsible for such a brutal crime. It's a, an awful cliche and I don't know how many people say it in tragic circumstances, but 